natural disasters, continuous outbreaks of disease, an economy on the brink of collapse, the people's hearts filled with grievance, and consecutive riots and protests, this is the current situation in China. We have been continuously updating our viewers with the latest information over the past week. This video will summarize the most significant events and news of the week so that you can have an overview. We invite you to follow along. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Epic Collapse in Chinese Economic History, 11 Might Embark on a High-Stakes Gamble China is experiencing a rapid eruption of issues spanning from the economy to people's livelihoods. Last Friday, the Asia market unexpectedly experienced the largest drop of the year, with a collective decline of over 2%. Just before the stock market's closing, the CCP's central bank released a set of market-disrupting data, revealing an astounding 89% plummet in new loans for July, with housing loans dropping nearly 78%, in comparison to the expected and previous values. Concurrently, China's M2 broad money supply increased by 10.7% year-on-year in July. In other words, despite the CCP's money printing efforts, no one is taking out loans anymore. Scholars and observers are astounded, remarking that while official data has historically been manipulated, the release of such abysmal indicators suggests that the actual situation might have deteriorated beyond concealment. China's economy likely experienced a substantial collapse in July. Some have even described this as an all-encompassing, epic collapse. A self-media figure questions how, during Friday's stock market crash, there were individuals selling frantically as soon as the market opened, indicating that some were attempting to make their escape. The question arises, how did these individuals foresee the central bank's impending release of this data several hours in advance? When these individuals exit, small investors are left trapped. The next step might very well be a collapse in the Chinese yuan's exchange rate. Another piece of bad news concerns the collapse of Zhongrong Trust, one of China's leading integrated financial service providers. A screenshot from an internal employee's social media circle has started circulating online, revealing that Zhongrong provided no internal warning prior to the collapse. Currently, the funds that customers cannot retrieve are in the tens of billions of yuan. Tensions naturally focus on the frontline wealth managers of Zhongrong Trust. Now, personal safety can't even be assured, Many wealth managers are arranging school transfers for their children, divorcing their spouses, cutting ties with their families, and heading alone into this seemingly inevitable battle. Furthermore, many listed companies and even state-owned holding corporations have been affected. In the face of this colossal disaster, the top echelons of Zhongrong Trust remain silent, leaving frontline employees to face the heat, having them explain directly to clients. Some predict that issues spanning from real estate to local government debts will coalesce, leading China into an imminent financial tsunami. Just as during the flooding in North China, where the low-lying Xiong'an New Area remained unscathed while the higher-altitude Zhuzhou suffered, under the Chinese Communist Party system, once economic troubles arise, the common people suffer the most. What's even worse is that the authorities haven't given any warnings to the citizens. Instead, they simultaneously suppress private analyses and fabricate favorable lies to deceive the public. A self-media figure, Lao Man, who has been consistently issuing warnings about China's economy in recent years, posted an article on the 13th expressing his lament. He noted that the Chinese people have made no preparations for the arrival of a crisis, whether psychologically or physically. Until this very moment, 99.999% of Chinese people simply do not believe that an economic crisis will occur in China. Furthermore, due to the government's erratic maneuvers, this crisis is on the brink of deteriorating into a financial crisis. The less the entire populace is prepared, the more severe the consequences of the crisis will be. Notably, Yao Cheng, a staff officer and colonel at the former Navy Command Headquarters, is worried about another matter. On the 12th, he posted a warning, asserting that Xi Jinping's performance in almost all domains has been disastrous, leaving no means of turning things around. The only option left is to launch an attack on Taiwan. He believes that by conquering Taiwan, she could divert attention from numerous flaws and secure his historical legacy. 
Yao Qing is certain that Xi Jinping would gamble with the lives of all Chinese citizens to achieve this goal, and all of this is expected to unfold within three to five years. Ominous premonition of catastrophe? 5,800 square kilometers subside in northern China, Hebei province erupts in unprecedented water spouts and boiling phenomena. In recent years, peculiar phenomena have been emerging endlessly in mainland China. For instance, species that have disappeared for a century reappear, rare typhoons occur frequently, and recently, after severe flooding in Hebei followed by receding waters, there has been an unusual phenomenon of bubbling in Baoding. This has naturally sparked the curiosity of the public, leaving them wondering what exactly is causing the land to bubble frantically. In response to this, an article on the WeChat public account Wife King Mu on the 13th analyzes the recent frequent heavy rainfall in the northern region of China, leading to extensive surface water appearing in Hebei, an area that had been suffering from drought for many years. However, a small accumulation of water on southern lands is quite normal. Yet, land flooding across the entire northern region of China is an extraordinary occurrence, especially in Hebei, where there hasn't been any flooding for decades. Due to the long-lasting drought, the northern region of China has had to heavily extract groundwater. For over 40 years, excessive groundwater extraction has caused the groundwater levels in the entire northern region to drop by dozens of meters. This means that beneath the seemingly normal land, there has long been severe drought. Even if you were to dig down 10 meters or even 20 meters, it would be difficult to find water, everything underneath is dry soil. Even if the amount of rainfall is sufficient to moisten all the soil beneath the surface, there are still huge voids underneath these dry surface layers, these are all created by years of underground water extraction. It's impossible to fill up these voids with water. The article provided an example, it's akin to putting an empty mineral water bottle into a pool of water. The water will flow into the bottle, causing it to release bubbles vigorously. This serves as the core reason for the land in Hebei bubbling intensely, a significant amount of underground water is being swiftly replenished. In regions with substantial soil gaps or interconnected voids, this phenomenon of bubbling arises. While it's widely known that China's northern region has been extensively extracting groundwater for years, resulting in notable declines in groundwater levels and occurrences of ground subsidence, only a few have truly explored the intricate details. China News Network emphasized China's severe drought and water scarcity concerns. With per capita water resources at just 2,300 cubic meters, a mere quarter of the global average, China stands among the countries with the most limited per capita water resources worldwide. Simultaneously, China's water resources are distributed unevenly, with a higher concentration in the southern regions and significantly less in the north. Following this trajectory, Hebei Province's Water Resources Department discloses that per capita water resources in Hebei are under 300 cubic meters, well below both the national average and the internationally recognized extremely water-scarce standard of 500 cubic meters per capita. In simpler terms, a substantial disparity exists between the water demand and actual rainfall in Hebei Province, and the underground water resources are fundamentally inadequate to bridge this gap. According to national statistics, by the end of 2013, Hebei province had cumulatively overdraft groundwater by 150 billion cubic meters over a span of more than 40 years, resulting in the formation of seven major funnel-shaped subsidence areas covering about 70,000 square kilometers. This has also contributed to substantial ground subsidence in various regions across China. Among them, as indicated by data from the Institute of Hydrogeology and Environmental Geology of the China Geological Survey in April 2022, the North China Plain stands out as the region with the most severe ground subsidence nationwide. Specifically, in 2018, the area affected by severe subsidence reached 5,800 square kilometers, accounting for 99.8% of the nationwide total. Beijing experienced the greatest cumulative subsidence of about 1.2 meters, Tianjin had a maximum cumulative subsidence of 3.25 meters, and cities like Tsangzhou and Hebei and Dizhou and Shandong also witnessed substantial subsidence. Additionally, ground subsidence has led to the sinking and cracking of railway embankments, buildings, 
underground pipelines, and as endangered dikes and river channels, posing a crisis. The crucial flood control sections of the Nanyun River have subsided by approximately one meter. It is estimated that the economic losses caused by the entire North China Plain's ground subsidence amount to over 330 billion yuan, approximately 45.6 billion US dollars. So, what does it mean when the ground sinks by more than one meter, or even three meters? It's akin to a car directly falling into a large sinkhole. Analysts believe that this phenomenon has now spread to the capital, Beijing, and in the future, it could potentially devastate the entire city. Given this series of challenges, people have begun to reflect on whether the CCP's advocated South North Water Diversion Project and its assertion of fighting against heaven and battling the earth are reliable strategies. Why did ancient North China experience abundant harvests, while modern rivers suffer from water shortages? Could this be related to the CCP's call for extensive groundwater extraction, coupled with the failures of water management projects? Simultaneous detonation of time bombs, Chinese millionaires urged to flee. As reported, an article from China's The Paper on August 10 confirmed that he may, the chairman of Weilian Group, the largest China-US immigration intermediary company in Shanghai, was officially criminally detained by the Shanghai Public Security Bureau. Additionally, five employees of the company were detained on suspicion of involvement in illegal foreign exchange trading, underground remittance activities, and generating illicit gains exceeding 100 million yuan. Reports suggest that the authorities have also requested the company to provide immigration-related documents spanning several decades, although this information has not been verified at present. The incident has immediately sparked discussions surrounding China's capital flows and foreign exchange controls. Financial scholar He Jiangbing told Radio Free Asia that this incident should be seen as a signal of China's severe economic situation. He stated, the authorities are tightly controlling the liquidity of capital and preventing free conversion between the Chinese yuan and foreign currencies to maintain the independence of their currency and exchange rate stability against the US dollar it must restrict itself in terms of freely convertible currencies. This is a very clear signal, they won't let it be exchanged, and they won't let it go out. Following the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an increase rather than a decrease in the number of Chinese immigration applications. The South China Morning Post reported in June that given the persistently weak economic conditions, lingering effects of the pandemic, and strained relations with major trading partners, China may once again witness the world's largest exodus of million-dollar millionaires this year. Henley and Partners, a prominent UK consulting firm, predicts that mainland China will lose 13,500 high-net-worth individuals, individuals with at least $1 million in investment wealth, this year, surpassing last year's loss of 10,800 high-net-worth individuals, setting a new record. According to Jean Lei, a Chinese individual engaged in immigration consulting in the United States for many years, China's foreign exchange control limit is $50,000 per person per year. If one is applying for immigration, taking the example of the EB-5 visa, which grants permanent residency to foreign entrepreneurs investing in the U.S., the investment amount used to be $500,000, but now it's $800,000. If one wants to remit more foreign exchange than the limit, it has to be done by splitting the remittances, which constitutes illegal foreign exchange trading. Jean Lay emphasized that this virtually declares that nearly everyone pursuing investment immigration is breaking the law. Furthermore, this case provides the CCP police with the grounds for investigations. Subsequent scrutiny of immigration companies and the punishment of individuals involved in illegal foreign exchange trading will likely become another major source of revenue for the CCP authorities. Zhang Lei candidly said, Chinese millionaires, hurry and run. If you wait any longer, you'll end up behind bars. Given that it's illegal, why has the CCP only recently decided to investigate immigration companies? Outsiders believe that aside from extorting money from these wealthy individuals or exploiting them, the CCP may also be seeking to acquire knowledge about the financial backgrounds of Chinese people who emigrate overseas. Xi Jinping enters unprecedented state of fear. Current affairs commentator Cheng Xiang believes that the true purpose of the CCP in these actions is not about money, 
but about ensuring political stability. This is because Xi Jinping perceives that both the officials and the public who emigrate overseas might be potential spies in latent crises, which could affect the security of his regime. Chin told the Vision Times that Li Hongzhong, vice chairman of the National People's Congress, once said, loyalty is not absolute, and absolute is not loyal. High-ranking CCP officials have been simultaneously holding positions while transferring embezzled money abroad over the past few decades. For the CCP, this behavior represents incomplete loyalty and is absolutely disloyal. Therefore, the CCP is collecting information on corrupt officials who have emigrated abroad. Some say that the CCP wants to harvest from them, but what's more important is their political loyalty. Ching points out, this indicates that Xi Jinping's regime has entered an unprecedented state of fear. He believes that anyone with connections to foreign countries might threaten the security of his regime. That's why he's launching mass spy-catching activities and investigating whether those who have emigrated overseas pose potential risks. I don't think he's trying to reclaim the money they fled with, more importantly, he wants to identify those who might be foreign spies or anti-Xi individuals. The CCP's counter-espionage law came into effect on July 1, and a mobilization order was issued via WeChat, calling on the entire population to report spies. Recently, the Tongbai County Public Security Bureau in Hunan Province released a short film titled Searching for the Walking 500,000, encouraging citizens to report spies to the government, with the possibility of receiving a maximum reward of 500,000 renminbi, approximately 69,000 US dollars. Ching Xiang says that the CCP has numerous overseas liaison offices. Individuals accused by the CCP as spies, their families, also become targets of CCP intimidation. Three timed bombs have been set off, leaving the CCP helpless. Political commentator Zhou Xiaohui points out that the CCP's timed bombs in the political sphere have begun counting down. For instance, the recent dismissal of Foreign Minister Qin Gang and the sweeping removal of top ranking officials within the rocket forces are signs. The highest echelons repeatedly emphasize loyalty and incite the entire nation against espionage, indicating underlying turbulence within the CCP. While Xi Jinping seems to wield ultimate power on the surface, there are still many dissenters within. A ticking bomb of financial crisis, Fox exampled the requests from Zhejiang province to tighten budgets and delays in paying police salaries and dalian. This dissatisfaction is affecting loyal government employees who work for the CCP. The CCP has even openly admitted that officials are adopting a doomsday mentality, becoming passive in their governance and transferring their families and assets overseas, ready to flee at any moment. A ticking time bomb in the economic sector, including the United States choking off Chinese technology and accelerating economic decoupling, successive collapses in the real estate and financial sectors, a drastic 89% decrease in new loans by China's banks in July compared to June, showcasing severe market confidence issues. A ticking time bomb in the societal sphere, the CCP's high-pressure rule internally coupled with the deteriorating economy, the financial system's exploitation of the populace, and the CCP's evasion of responsibility in man-made disasters have been causing growing discontent and resentment among the people. These occurrences are waking the public up time and time again. For instance, in the recent floods in North China and Northeast China, social media no longer sees rallying cries, people are no longer donating, and flood victims are daring to stand up and demand compensation. He points out that in a society simmering with public grievances, where more and more people are saying no to defend their interests, this rising public outcry could likely drive the CCP's knowledgeable individuals from within to dismantle the CCP. The CCP's internal bomb is also about to explode. Shanghai is the capital of China's economy and the old stronghold of the late CCP leader Jiang Zemin. During Jiang's rule of China, he led CCP officials to quietly amass wealth, giving rise to a portrayal of a thoroughly corrupt CCP officialdom. After the CCP's 18th National Congress, she launched the anti-corruption campaign, taking down hundreds of high-ranking officials, tigers, to intimidate the lower-level ones, monkeys, along with millions of lower-level officials, flies, 
antagonizing the entire interest group of corrupt officials led by Jiang Zemin and Zheng Qinghong. By the time of the CCP's 19th National Congress, in order to secure the CCP's political power, Xi Jinping didn't dare to capture the big tigers and compromised with the Jiang faction. However, after nearly a decade of the anti-corruption movement, it has stirred up fundamental interests throughout the layers and factions of the CCP, fueling the anti-Xi forces born out of resentment. This ongoing power struggle within the CCP has escalated further. These CCP officials had long been transferring a significant amount of assets overseas. If the lid is lifted on this extensive corruption, the legitimacy of the CCP's regime could crumble, leading to a rapid downfall. During the CCP's Beidei conference, the chairman of Shanghai's largest immigration company was arrested. This might be Xi Jinping's warning to the anti-Xi forces, a sign of mutual destruction. This ticking time bomb of long-standing infighting within the CCP is likely to explode soon. Damn Burst Tragedy Reports suggest only a few survivors in entire Heilongjiang village, official casualty figures not released. A viral sensation on the internet today reports that from August 2 to 4, heavy rain and torrential downpours struck the southern region of Heilongjiang province, resulting in rapid river swelling and dam breaches. The footage reveals that when the dam burst, the floodwaters rushed in from all directions, leaving the villagers with no place to flee and the floodwaters quickly submerged and swept away Daxiton, a forestry station in Dongjingqing under the Mudanjiang City Forestry Bureau in Heilongjiang Province. Videos shared by netizens depict that only a few villagers remain, taking refuge on the mountainside to escape the flood disaster. Others were washed away by the floodwaters and are missing. Among those seeking refuge on the hill are mostly elderly residents, children, and injured individuals. They are struggling with food shortages and are currently awaiting rescue. It is known that the village shown in the video is not Daxiton, which suffered the most severe devastation. Daxiton has been entirely washed away. According to the report, it is stated that three forestry officials went door to door in the middle of the night to notify residents to evacuate. At that moment, the dam burst and the three individuals were swept away by the flood. However, the report does not specify whether it was the dam of a reservoir or the breach of a river embankment. It also does not mention the number of villagers who have died or gone missing. According to NTD TV, due to the lack of planning and unannounced flood discharge by the Chinese Communist authorities, thousands of acres of fertile land in Heilongjiang, which is known as one of China's main granaries, have now been severely devastated. The complete crop failure has left the local population with significant losses. Villagers are questioning, who is responsible for these natural disasters and human-made calamities? A farmer expresses his anger, questioning the experts in the water management department and their ineffective use of taxpayers' money. Every time you make a decision, do you prioritize the interests of the common people? We accept that we can't control natural disasters but who is responsible for the human-made calamities? Don't provoke us farmers, don't make us furious. Looking at their hometowns after the floodwaters receded, the people of Heilongjiang are left with unspeakable hardships. A Heilongjiang resident said, Seeing our place like this, the feeling of not being able to return home is indescribable. Who can understand? It feels like a dream, like we've lost everything. According to China's National Financial Supervision and Administration Commission, as of 10 a.m. on August 8, insurance companies in 16 disaster-affected areas, including Hebei, have reported receiving a total of 207,900 insurance claims, estimating losses to be around 7.131 billion yuan, approximately 994 million U.S. dollars. At present, they have already settled 68,600 cases, with a total payout amounting to 432 million yuan, approximately 60 million US dollars. Beijing floods claim 33 lives, leave 1.29 million affected, expected three-year reconstruction. Due to being hit by a massive flood disaster recently, Beijing has incurred heavy economic losses and casualties. The latest official report from the Beijing municipal government indicates that nearly 1.29 million people have been affected by this catastrophe, 
with 59,000 houses collapsing and 147,000 houses suffering severe damage. The affected area for agricultural crops is estimated at 225,000 acres. As of August 8, 2400 hours, the disaster has resulted in 33 deaths, and 18 people are still missing. The calculation of property losses is ongoing. However, local residents in Beijing do not believe the death toll figures announced by the CCP authorities. Mr. Li, a resident of Fangshan District in Beijing, told Sound of Hope Radio, Who would believe it? Who would believe it? Based on what I know about Nangu, I heard on August 2 that a bus got trapped and didn't come out. It was completely buried. How many people were on that bus? Mentugu is very much like Fangshan District. The disaster-stricken canal in Mentugu and the northern canal in Fangshan are divided by just one mountain, Mount Ling. As a result, their losses are nearly identical. Roads have been utterly obliterated, villages have been ravaged, and regarding the count of casualties, it's best not to trust the official report. To get a more accurate figure from the official statement, simply append a zero at the end. In an unusual departure from the norm, what sets apart this massive disaster is the complete absence of officials from the CCP and the military at the disaster scenes. This absence has triggered significant dissatisfaction among the public and in public opinion. Mr. Lee remarked, it's over. The CCP officials and military are all preoccupied with posing for photos instead of actively engaging in rescue efforts. If someone like Tsai Ing-wen were to behave similarly, her approval ratings would likely plummet by 10 to 25 points. However, there's no escaping the fact that, following China's historical cycle of dynasties, we are presently in the declining phase of a dynasty. Hence, anything unusual happening is perceived as normal. Furthermore, it's worth noting that after the flooding in Beijing, local officials uniformly asserted that the post-disaster reconstruction goal is to achieve basic recovery within one year, comprehensive enhancement within three years. The term basic recovery within one year entails repairing flood control water facilities within approximately a year, completing repairs and reinforcement of damaged houses, reconstructing self-built homes for rural residents, and bolstering infrastructure such as transportation, energy, communication, education, healthcare, and other public services to restore capabilities to pre-disaster levels. This development has not only spurred widespread skepticism among the public, prompting questions about the actions of the Beijing government throughout this time that it looks like Beijing hasn't made any repairs to flood control facilities in the past few decades. Some netizens highlighted that if the flood situation is so dire in Beijing alone, one can only imagine the severity in other areas of Hebei province. Others disclosed that electricity has not yet been reinstated in their villages, underscoring the urgency to expedite the pace of disaster relief efforts. Subway construction has led to ground subsidence in a Wuhan neighborhood, prompting the urgent overnight evacuation of residents. On August 8, in Wuhan, a 30-story residential building and a community named Haifu Jiangcheng experienced subsidence due to subway construction, prompting the property management to issue an urgent evacuation notice overnight. A series of quite alarming messages have been circulating online, indicating that the building next to Haifu Jiangcheng is leaning, and I am Chen Huajia, the construction supervisor downstairs. We kindly ask you to evacuate the two buildings immediately as the road condition beneath is sinking. Please do not be afraid, cooperate by opening the door, evacuate first, evacuate first. In response, one resident expressed, this is our only home. In this scorching weather, where should we go for evacuation? A circulated video depicts residents gathered on the road below during the night, engaged in discussions. Around 11 p.m., the residents of these buildings were relocated to nearby hotels. According to reports, the incident occurred near the Haifu Jiangcheng Tianyuni district, where two residential buildings are located. A property owner told the media that construction had been ongoing at the site for over a year, and small cracks had started appearing in their homes at an unspecified time. They had previously reported these issues to the community and local authorities. Another resident of the Haifu Jiangcheng community named Luo Ning, alias, said that the community was only about six or seven years old, making it relatively new, 
and expressed deep concerns about the future safety of the community, stating, the key question now is, who would dare to live in these houses? On the evening of August 8, Wuhan Metro issued a notice stating that at 1840, there was a water leakage danger at the foundation pit of Xingya Road Station on Line 12 of the Wuhan Rail Transit. This resulted in a partial subsidence of Xingya Road, covering an area of approximately 20 meters in length and 10 meters in width. The on-site danger had been brought under control, and after on-site inspection, the foundation pit and surrounding buildings were deemed to be safe and stable. However, on the morning of August 9, a resident of the Haifu Jiangcheng community told Huashang Daily that, we only saw the road collapse, and the subsidence beneath the road is quite significant. The area has been cordoned off, and we can't access it. Regarding the Wuhan Metro's respond, NetEase users, in a sarcastic manner using typical CCP phrases, commented, the dangerous building's residents have already been brought under control, their emotions are very stable, the test results are unsurprising, as long as it doesn't collapse, it must be considered safe after evaluation. Hopeless economic recovery, China's July imports and exports plunge dramatically. On August 8, China's General Administration of Customs published data showing the latest trade figures for July. However, a significant decline in both imports and exports, which fell below market expectations, has raised concerns that the momentum of China's economic growth has nearly vanished. In detail, in terms of US dollars, China's total imports and exports for July amounted to $482.92 billion, a year-on-year -year decrease of 13.6%. Among these, exports dropped by 14.5%, worse than the market's originally predicted export contraction of 12.5 percent. This marks the largest decrease since February 2020. Imports, on the other hand, experienced a decline of 12.4 percent, widening the drop by 5.6 percent and faring worse than the market's initial projection of a 5 percent contraction. Wang Yi, a columnist for Epoch Times, stated, the decline in China's economy and exports has several reasons. Firstly, it's due to the overall economic situation globally, with low growth rates and unfavorable prospects. Secondly, there are structural issues, as some of China's products are facing problems with competitiveness. Another factor is the substitution effect. Economist Jing Guang, who resides in the United States, commented, I think the situation might worsen further, especially in terms of imports. However, I must say that the real surprise to me is the real estate sector. July might be a significant turning point. Another major concern is the real estate sales in July, which have plummeted dramatically. The sales for the top 100 companies from January to July have decreased by 5%, but the contract sales in July dropped by 33%. Additionally, in July, Country Garden sales dropped by 60%. So, it seems that if urgent and significant measures are not taken in the real estate sector, a feeling of imminent crisis might be approaching. Regionally, China's exports to major countries like the United States and Europe have all fallen compared to the same period last year. In detail, it decreased to $42.3 billion, marking a 23% year-on-year decline, which has been consistent for 12 consecutive months. Imports from the United States also dropped to $12 billion, a decrease of 11.1%. Similarly, China's exports to the European Union also saw a year-on-year -year drop of 39.5%, amounting to $42.4 billion, while imports from the EU plummeted even further by 44.1%, reaching $23.3 billion. In contrast, China's exports to Russia in July increased by 52% year-on-year, highlighting the increasingly close economic and trade relationship between China and Russia against the backdrop of the Russia-Ukraine conflict and Western sanctions. Experts believe that the comprehensive decline in China's imports and exports underscores the mounting pressure on China's economy, which is already grappling with challenges due to a global economic slowdown. According to Wang Yi, China's three pillars of investment, consumption, and exports have all ground to a halt, exacerbating the ongoing deterioration of the Chinese economy. Despite the Beijing authorities' efforts to implement additional measures aimed at stimulating economic growth, 
there has been minimal discernible impact thus far. Mr. Wang emphasized, unless the CCP fundamentally shifts its international strategy, makes profound adjustments to domestic policies, and thoroughly overhauls its economic approach, the future of China's economy will remain uncertain. Another enormous thunderclap looms suspended in the sky, analysis reveals an unimaginable Chinese-style crisis approaching. The final news today continues to focus on the Chinese economy. One year ago, Evergrande plunged into a debt crisis, triggering a paralysis in the Chinese real estate market. Now, another Chinese real estate giant, Country Garden, is also teetering on the edge. On August 8, the Financial Times reported that Country Garden failed to make timely payments on two matured dollar-denominated debts. These two debts, totaling $22.5 million, represent the interest payments on two loans for Country Garden. These debts come with a grace period of 30 days. This implies that if Country Garden can make the payments within the next 30 days, it may avoid being declared in default. Financial journalist Hu Kaiping stated that this is a bigger bombshell than Evergrande, and it seems that Xi Jinping might have to step in to save the situation. But the question is how to save it. Xia Jina, chairman of Tsaishuan Media, mentioned that the debts of Evergrande and Country Garden are enormous, to the point where they could be described as debt capable of rivaling a nation's. In theory, these companies should have undergone bankruptcy liquidation long ago, but under the special system of the Chinese Communist Party, these companies that should have fallen cannot fall. As a result, it will ultimately fall upon the banks, and the crisis in the Chinese real estate industry is soon to collide with the financial system. If the entire burden falls on the Chinese banking industry, it will lead to a deeper crisis. A self-media expert in economic trend analysis, Lao Man, posted on August 8, stating that the Chinese-style economic crisis will be far more extensive and profound than anyone can imagine, one might say it's a relentless ordeal. Lao Man believes that the core issues of China's economy can be divided into two parts, internally, the collapse of the real estate market and the bursting of the bubble will trigger a series of chain reactions. This includes a sharp decline in local government revenue, leading to a local debt crisis. Defaults on real estate developers' debts will then induce a financial system crisis. Inability of real estate developers to deliver properties on time will contribute to social unrest. Externally, the crisis stems from Western containment measures causing a sharp contraction in exports and accelerating outflows of foreign capital. Consequences will include an inevitable acceleration of the depreciation of the Chinese yuan and a further increase in widespread unemployment, fueling social unrest. Lao Man says that if we follow this logic, China is about to enter an exceptionally arduous period, which can be endured. However, the situation is not so simple, as the most fundamental issue in the Chinese economy is the lack of constraint on power. Authorities do whatever they want, and they won't tolerate the bursting of the real estate bubble. They will certainly try to maintain the bubble. But now, the common people lack funds, and government revenue is insufficient. They can only rely on banks, forcing banks to invest in the real estate industry and support the bubble through loans. But where will the banks get the money from? The profit margins in the banking industry have now dwindled to just over 1% leaving very little room for profit. If the banks continue to support the real estate sector, the inevitable result will be that the banking industry will face widespread losses. Every single penny that the banks lose translates to the hard-earned savings of the depositors. It's not hard to foresee that an unprecedented wave of bank bankruptcies, something never before witnessed in human history, will occur in China in the near future. The savings of regular people could suddenly vanish. Lao Man went on to analyze that, at this point, the authorities will undoubtedly intervene. On one hand, they will likely resort to printing more money. However, whether the act of printing money out of thin air can actually rescue the countless financially troubled commercial banks remains uncertain. This situation has never occurred in human history, making it difficult to predict the outcome. What can be guaranteed, though, is that the Chinese currency will depreciate to unimaginable levels. On the other hand, in an attempt to prevent societal unrest, the authorities will tighten their grip on the population. China might no longer have any independent media, 
and the entire Chinese society will be tightly compressed into a ticking time bomb brimming with pent-up frustrations. There will be no outlet for societal grievances to vent, and the ultimate consequences of such a scenario are beyond anyone's ability to predict. Shandong announced open spaces for earthquake shelters, Dijou Square crowded with tents. Following the earthquake in Dijou, Shandong, on August 6, various unusual phenomena continued to occur in northern China, causing concerns among the public that there might be a major earthquake. Recently, several cities in Shandong announced open spaces for earthquake shelters. Dijou reported another earthquake on August 12, and on the night of August 11, many tents for staying appeared in the central square, with many families preparing to spend the night there. These scenes were filmed by a local resident who said, the earthquakes frightened us. Yesterday, the city held an emergency meeting. August 15 is an air raid warning and they announced 24 emergency evacuation open spaces. It's clearly for earthquake preparedness. The video garnered hundreds of comments. However, no earthquake occurred on the 12th, and the alarm has been lifted. Nonetheless, some individuals in the comments section mentioned that there was indeed a tremor around 11 p.m. that night, even though there were no official earthquake predictions. Some people from Hebei also left comments, at 6.30 p.m. tonight, there was a spectacular sunset at the border between Dijou City in Shandong and Wuchiao County in Hebei. It was accompanied by a dark cloud. Someone had just live-streamed the scene as they were passing through the plains, where people were sleeping in tents for shelter. Some netizens from Shandong uploaded strange cloud formations in Dijou and peculiar light clusters in the night sky of Qingdao's Jima, asking if these were normal. As previously reported, following the major flooding in Hebei and the earthquake in Shandong, various strange phenomena have been occurring frequently, including eerie night skies, groundwater spouts, unusual animal migrations, and more. Netizens have been sharing these anomalies online and discussing whether they could be signs of a major earthquake. Many residents of Dijou mentioned that while they hadn't moved outside to live, they had made preparations and were ready to leave their homes at any time. Because there have been too many signs of earthquakes recently, making it entirely necessary to be prepared in advance. Another major epidemic approaching? Inner Mongolia reports three confirmed plague cases in one week. As the flood disaster continues and the coronavirus still rages on with increasing reports of infections, on August 12, there have been three consecutive confirmed plague cases in Sunit Right Banner. Xilingal League, Inner Mongolia. This undoubtedly worsens the situation and raises concerns both within and outside of China about the potential plague outbreak under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, on the mainland. This information has been confirmed by the Health Commission of Sunit Right Banner, Xilingal League, Inner Mongolia. Specifically, on August 12, two confirmed plague cases were reported in Sunit Right Banner. These cases involve a husband and daughter from the same household, who were previously reported as plague cases on August 7. Currently, the patients are receiving treatment at a designated hospital and close contacts have not shown any abnormal symptoms. The situation is being closely monitored. Plague, also known as the Black Death, is a type of pandemic characterized by rapid onset, short duration, high fatality rate, strong infectivity, and swift transmission. This disease is primarily transmitted through rodents. Although cases of bubonic plague have become increasingly rare, they are not uncommon in China. The incubation period for plague is relatively short, generally ranging from 1 to 6 days, although in rare cases, it can extend to 8 or 9 days. Xinhua reported in July 2022 that there were 11 confirmed cases of plague in Inner Mongolia and Ningxia, China, from 2019 to 2022. Specifically, there were five cases of plague in 2019, with one death, four cases in 2020, resulting in three deaths, one case in 2021, and one case in 2022. However, according to reports from mainland media such as the paper, China News in September 2022, after the resurgence of the COVID-19 pandemic and the two-month lockdown in Shanghai, there was an increase in rat density around September of the same year. However, official media did not provide further follow-up reports, 
making it difficult for the public to understand the actual situation at that time. According to statistics from the World Health Organization, who, around 1,000 to 2,000 people are infected with plague each year. However, due to the large number of unreported cases, this data is not considered to accurately reflect the reality. Additionally, considering the opacity of data during the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in mainland China in recent years, the resurgence of plague in Inner Mongolia raises concerns about whether authorities might be concealing information from the public. According to historical records, during the late Qing dynasty, the final imperial dynasty in China, a succession of disasters including plagues, locusts, droughts, floods, and severe cold led to the downfall of the dynasty, culminating with a final plague that sealed its fate. From 2020 until now, mainland China under the rule of the CCP has experienced a series of unprecedented disasters, including the COVID-19 pandemic, African swine fever, monkeypox, locusts, droughts, floods, and earthquakes. This has led to the number of deaths remaining a secret under the regime. These consecutive catastrophes have caused deep concern. Who lifts monkeypox emergency health declaration? China experiences sudden surge. Here's a continued update on monkeypox, which is silently spreading among the male population engaging in same sex activities, with 80% of cases being isolated incidents. From January 2022 to April 2023, more than 87,000 confirmed cases of monkeypox were reported in 111 countries or regions worldwide, with 140 deaths leading the WHO to declare on July 23 last year that the monkeypox situation constituted an international public health emergency. Later, with a decline in the global monkeypox case count and stabilization, WHO Director General Ted Rose announced on May 11 that monkeypox no longer constituted a public health emergency of international concern. However, in China, the monkeypox situation seems to be expanding. According to data from the China Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, there were 106 newly confirmed cases of monkeypox across China in June, followed by an additional 491 cases in July. After enduring the COVID-19 pandemic for three years and finally lifting lockdowns, there is now a new outbreak of monkeypox in China. Chinese netizens are questioning why there was such a significant increase in confirmed monkeypox cases in July compared to June. Qin Peng, a commentator on current affairs based in the U.S., remarked, I think the concerns of netizens are reasonable because, for one, the CCP has a habitual tendency to conceal infectious diseases. If there are too many infectious diseases, they might feel somewhat embarrassed, especially when monkeypox is relatively controlled worldwide. A widespread outbreak in China at this time could have a substantial impact. Professor Liu from the Canadian College of Traditional Chinese Medicine stated, in specific groups, individuals might have dual infections. For instance, if someone had previously been infected with COVID-19 and continues engaging in risky same-sex activities, their infection rate might increase. He added, in Chinese society, Many people don't have the kind of religious restrictions towards homosexuality that you might find in the West. Many people live in households where they might find it difficult to maintain a good image or face societal pressures. So, in reality, the prevalence of this behavior might actually be higher than in the West, but it's more hidden or occurs secretly. The Communist Party's ideology can control people's thoughts, but it's not overly invested in curbing risky behaviors. In many cases, there's a certain level of tolerance, which I believe contributes to the spread. Three years ago, before the outbreak of the COVID-19 epidemic, Wuhan, the epicenter of the pandemic, saw around 5 million people leave before the city was locked down. Their international travel trajectories covered nearly the entire globe. Now, as China approved outbound group tours for 78 countries on August 10, the world is concerned whether the monkeypox virus will become the second virus, after COVID-19, to trigger a major global outbreak. Sluggish consumer demand, Beijing plans to relax household registration, experts, creating illusions to satisfy hunger. Since the second quarter of this year, China's economy has been continuously declining, with weak consumer demand. 
Beijing authorities plan to relax the household registration system to attract rural populations to urban areas in order to stimulate consumption. Experts point out that relying on rural populations moving to cities to boost consumption is merely a pie-in-the-sky solution. The Chinese Ministry of Public Security announced plans to implement household registration reforms this month, aiming to ease residency requirements and facilitate urban residency. These changes aim to encourage skilled rural individuals to settle in cities, along with addressing urban laborers' residency issues. Subsequently, former deputy director of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Cass, Kaifang, took the opportunity during a recent forum to endorse the background authority's so-called household registration reform. He claimed that this reform could release the consumption desires of the already urbanized 180 million migrant workers without needing to increase their incomes. Chinese National Bureau of Statistics data shows an urban permanent population of around 920 million by 2022's end, with rural permanent population at 491 million, yielding a 65% urbanization rate. Some scholars compare this to developed nations like the US, UK, Japan, Canada, and Australia with urbanization rates surpassing 80%, notably 92% in Japan. However, some economists also point out that the key issue lies not in household registration but in confidence. The Beijing authorities' attempt to solve the problem of sluggish consumption through population urbanization is merely a form of creating illusions to satisfy hunger. Chinese economist Gong Xingli recently told Voice of America that he doubts the effectiveness of the mentioned reforms. He questioned how rural individuals moving to cities could succeed beyond finding jobs given challenges like housing and livelihoods. He highlighted the contrast between lofty ideas and harsh reality. Gong also noted that rural residents in China earn less than 3,000 Chinese yuan per month, making city living challenging. Wealthier individuals would likely consider immigrating abroad. He further analyzed that due to numerous business closures, major cities are grappling with surging unemployment. This situation, coupled with urban workers' job losses, makes it difficult for cities to absorb more rural labor. A survey by Beijing's Caixin Magazine's Industry Research Center found that in 2022, over 1.94 million businesses shut down across China's wealthiest cities. Former deputy director of the Pangol Institution, Jiang Hao, mentioned in a Voice of America interview that China's current economic problems have shaken confidence among domestic and foreign investors. Thus, the household registration reforms seem like a symbolic gesture, tackling less impactful issues. Jiang emphasized that China struggles to instill investor confidence due to uncertainties, making capitalists reluctant to stay. Gong Xingli directly stated that China's unique household registration system should have been abolished long ago due to its abnormal nature. He said, the household registration system is a peculiar phenomenon unique to China and not found anywhere else in the world. The fundamental principle in other countries is the freedom of people's movement, but in China, the household registration system reform has never been fully implemented, and it's still unclear why they persist with it. He stated that the lack of complete freedom of movement for the people not only increases the operating costs for businesses but also hinders alignment with the international community. China's local debt reaches 94 trillion yuan, storm strikes Beijing, the ticking time bomb is ready to explode. Since entering August, floods have ravaged more than half of China, Evergrande defaulted, China Zhongji Group, a leading Chinese asset management corporation, defaulted, China Rongxin Trust, a Chinese financial institution that specializes in providing trust and wealth management services, defaulted, the U.S. prohibited high-tech investments, imports and exports plummeted by 13.6% in July, corruption in the medical system is escalating, July's Consumer Price Index, CPI, was minus 0.3%, the number of inbound tourists for domestic travel in the first quarter of 2023 plummeted by 98.6% compared to 2019, and so on and so forth. It can be said that the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, is sitting on a volcano. Especially concerning local debt, according to estimates by Goldman Sachs, the cumulative debt of Chinese local governments has reached a staggering 94 trillion Chinese yuan, nearly 13 trillion US dollars, 
including debts not accounted for on the balance sheet. On August 11, the Financial Times reported that a working group, composed of the central bank, the CCP's Ministry of Finance, and securities regulatory authorities, dispatched by the state council, has been sent to over 10 financially challenged provinces to conduct audits, seeking methods to reduce debt, and reporting directly to Premier Li Chang of the CCP's state council. This represents the largest top-down approach that the CCP has adopted over the years to address the issue of local government debt, highlighting the regime's growing concern about financial risks. The report cites sources indicating that one of the most crucial tasks of the working group currently is to scrutinize and categorize the hidden debts of local government financing platforms. These hidden debts are not included on the balance sheets of local governments but are funds raised through off-market or other non-public channels. Data released by researchers at J.P. Morgan Chase in June shows that China's overall debt has reached 282% of its GDP. However, the troubles are far from over. Just as one crisis subsides, another emerges. There are alarming reports that China's state-owned enterprise, China Zhongrong International Trust, is facing a default crisis. According to a report by Phoenix News, China Zhongrong International Trust has currently suspended redemption for at least 350 billion renminbi, approximately 48.6 billion US dollars, worth of trust products. In recent years, China Zhongrong Trust's real estate business has been steadily growing. From 2017 to 2020, the proportion of trust assets invested in real estate was 6.61%, 10.99%, 17.65% and 18%, respectively. In 2021, China Zhongrong Trust reduced the proportion of real estate business to 14.02%, with a scale of 89.555 billion renminbi, approximately 12.4 billion US dollars. The current state of China's real estate market can be accurately described as dire. As previously reported, on the 10th, during a private fundraising event, U.S. President Biden remarked that China's escalating economic issues have turned the CCP into a ticking time bomb, and he noted that the rising unemployment rate and aging workforce have caused significant trouble for the CCP. He mentioned, this isn't good because when bad guys get into trouble, they tend to do bad things. Wang Huntao, the chairman of the China Democracy Party and a PhD in political science from Columbia University, shared with Sound of Hope that the root cause of China's economic deterioration lies in the expansion of CCP's authoritarian rule. He stated, the Chinese economy, like many authoritarian governments of the 20th century, started with freedom, market liberalization, and economic freedom, which led to economic development. Then they began expanding their power, resulting in an economic decline. After the economy declines, they won't correct their mistakes, instead, they might engage in wrongdoing to cover up their errors. In the past, during the Great Famine caused by Mao Zedong, he initially blamed it on natural disasters. Then he said it was the Soviet Union suppressing us and forcing us to repay debts, or the United States imposing sanctions on us. In reality, he led us through those difficult times, which he propagandized. The CCP took the wrong path or could relive Japan's lost decade. An article in the Wall Street Journal warned at the end of July that China might be heading towards a lost decade similar to Japan's. Japan had chosen to distribute the pain caused by the real estate bubble over decades of sluggish growth rather than enduring short-term, severe shocks. This was due to concerns that such immediate shocks could lead to unforeseen creative destruction. The article suggests that if the Chinese authorities continue to provide loans to troubled developers like China Evergrande and weaken risks, these real estate enterprises could turn into zombie companies, wasting economic resources. If these companies are forced to restructure and shut down, they could default on loans, causing short term losses for lending institutions and temporarily restraining economic growth. The article mentions that although CCP-controlled media like The People's Daily published anonymous commentaries warning of economic risks in 2016, and Chinese economists extensively studied Japan, the authorities did not take action but chose a more erroneous path. This is because it's politically difficult for the CCP to tell the Chinese people that the homes they purchased during the bubble period might never be completed, 
and it's also challenging to allow well-connected developers to fail or withdraw support for sales. Such actions could lead to economic upheaval, and the CCP is concerned about the political risks that could come from it. Mass strikes across China, is the resistance powder keg about to explode? Due to the decline of the Chinese economy, people's lives are becoming increasingly difficult. In recent days, collective strikes and violent resistance events have erupted in multiple regions of China. Some netizens commented that under the authoritarian rule of the CCP, people's lives have become incredibly challenging, and each person is like a suppressed powder keg, ready to explode at any moment. A viral video shows that on August 16, bus drivers in Tian, Shandong, went on a collective strike. Due to local financial issues, their wages have been delayed for seven months. Text on the video reads, employees need to eat. It's not limited to Shandong. According to netizen reports, on August 15, a large factory in Shenzhen with thousands of employees, Xian and Electric, dissolved overnight. In May, the factory's employees went on a full-scale strike regarding housing fund issues. Netizens say that many companies in Shenzhen have started to delay wage payments, and by the end of the year, many might go bankrupt. It's not just workers, even food delivery riders have risen in resistance. Netizen reports revealed that on August 10, in Wuyue Plaza, Changzhou, Jiangsu, food delivery riders parked their vehicles in the parking lot while making deliveries, and the security guards of the plaza locked their bikes. The video shows many food delivery riders wearing yellow shirts breaking through the barriers, surrounded by security guards in blue. Netizens discussed, saying that the group of food delivery riders is like a modern-day beggar gang. They have organized themselves and are not to be trifled with. Many netizens sympathize with food delivery riders, saying, life is tough for everyone on the lower rungs, there's no need to make things difficult for each other. Furthermore, due to the pressure of earning a livelihood, there has been a significant increase in tragic and violent incidents claiming lives in China recently, especially in August of this year. Some netizens commented that under the despotic rule of the Chinese Communist Party, people's lives are extremely difficult, and activities that concern the soul and spirit, like religion, are not allowed to exist normally. Under this extreme pressure, most people find themselves in abnormal modes of thinking, habits, and psychological states. The frequent occurrence of such tragedies has become inevitable. In addition, in this economic environment, both ordinary citizens and government officials are financially strained. As a result, these lower-level officials will squeeze and exploit the common people even more ruthlessly. Therefore, the ordinary citizens will harbor more resentment and resort to more violent resistance against these officials. All of these are the bitter consequences caused by the party's leadership. Hostels in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou overflow with young job seekers, Weibo removes associated trending searches. As previously reported, amidst the youth unemployment rate in China has repeatedly reached new highs. On August 15, the Chinese National Bureau of Statistics even announced the suspension of publishing the youth unemployment rate, which has attracted significant attention from the outside world. On the same day, the magazine Sanli and Life Weekly published a special report titled In the Youth Hostels of Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, crowded with young people who can't find jobs which drew public attention. According to the report, during the most challenging job season, many young people left their homes and came to Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou in search of more job opportunities. Youth hostels, due to their low costs and the stay-as-you-go model, have become their best choice for settling down in big cities. Those who wander in the youth hostels in the city centers, some have experienced repeated unemployment but still remain hopeful, while others have gone round and round back to the starting point, without finding their own direction. The magazine interviewed a young man named Zhang Wen, 24-year-old, who is from Nantong, Jiangsu province, and searching for jobs in Guangzhou. Zhang resides in a youth hostel where the daily rent is 60 yuan, about 8.25 US dollars. He has to find every possible way to save money. To cut costs, he goes to the library to drink free water, eats only one proper meal a day, 
and sometimes walks three to four kilometers from the youth hostel to a nearby food wholesale market to buy biscuits or instant noodles to fill his stomach. During the interview, he even opened his refrigerator and pointed to some sticky rice dumplings that he hadn't finished eating for two weeks, saying, I can rely on these for a few more days this week. After the publication of this article, the hashtag hashtag people flocking to youth hostels in Beijing Shanghai Guangzhou because they can't find jobs hashtag trended, but it was subsequently blocked on Weibo. Notably, Sanlian Link's Life Weekly has opened up its Weibo comments section, and a large number of netizens have left messages, expressing that they were shocked when they actually opened up the comments section. One user mocked, Are you intentionally causing trouble? The Statistics Bureau just announced today that they won't be calculating the youth unemployment rate anymore, and you're promoting this. What's your intention? Another commented, they're covering themselves, yet you're uncovering them. I'm dying of laughter. Some netizens pointed out, the reality is that many locals in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen have been unemployed for a long time. If they don't take strong measures to stabilize employment, it will cause significant social problems. However, this attention-grabbing article has been blocked by Weibo. In response to this, current affairs commentator Wang He believes that in the midst of a substantial youth unemployment issue, the Chinese Communist Party CCP, authorities are employing an ostrich-like strategy, evading reality by suspending the publication of the youth unemployment rate. Yet, their heavy-handed tactics could potentially trigger heightened dissatisfaction and public outrage. In the present era, with the advancement of the internet, interpersonal interactions disseminate through online platforms, and despite the utilization of sophisticated surveillance and monitoring techniques, the CCP might struggle to fully sever these interconnected relationships. Analysts suggest that the public's anger towards the CCP is not just confined to the elderly or the white paper movement. It's becoming widespread and deeply rooted. Wang Yi believes that the CCP is revealing a dual crisis. One is the crisis of whether Xi Jinping can continue to govern, the other is the crisis of how long the CCP's regime can hold on. More and more people are awakening, and even without Xi Jinping's leadership, they want to see the Communist Party step down. He said, the situation in China is extremely serious, and major changes may be lurking within. Investors gather outside Zhongrong Trust, demanding repayment. A wave of debt defaults is rampant throughout China. It's not limited to the real estate industry but also extends to China's extensive shadow banking sector. The news of payment defaults by China's long-standing trust company, Zhongrong Trust, has ignited public discussions. According to a Bloomberg report, video footage of the event shows approximately 20 angry protesters gathered outside the Zhongrong Trust office building in Beijing. They are demanding that this trust giant fulfill its high-yield investment products. Later, the protesters in Beijing encountered about 10 police officers and security personnel, while a company official attempted to maintain order. An angry woman questions, why isn't the company repaying us? She says, it's already past the due date, and your financial reports show profits. Another woman shouts, give us our money back, or we'll die here. Protests stemming from financial disputes are relatively common in China, but authorities are unlikely to tolerate them, especially in the stability-focused capital, Beijing. As evidence, according to Bloomberg, a reporter visited Zhongrong Trust's office building on Wednesday afternoon and didn't see any protesters at that time. However, there was an unusually dense police presence around the building. Several police cars and vehicles were parked inside and outside the Zhongrong Trust office building, with officers inside. Additionally, more police cars were parked on nearby streets, while workers were erecting additional barriers around the building. Insiders have informed Bloomberg that Wang Chang, the board secretary of Zhongrong Trust, revealed to investors in a meeting earlier this week that the company's liquidity suddenly dried up. Therefore, the company is facing an avalanche-like questioning from investors and their wealth managers. Bloomberg states that the eruption of protest activities indicates that the problems facing China's distressed shadow banking sector are more severe than previously known highlighting how the slowdown in the real estate market is spreading its impact to the financial sector. 
trust companies are a significant part of China's shadow banking system, which consists of non-bank lending entities. Apart from managing entrusted assets, many trust companies also directly sell high-yield investment products to corporations and individuals. These trust companies invest raised funds in various assets or provide direct loans to companies or real estate projects, often those unable to secure financing from traditional banks or the bond market. Zhongrong Trust's annual report shows that real estate accounts for 11% of the 629 billion yuan, approximately 3.9 billion US dollars, in trust assets it manages. Last year, the company purchased shares in at least 10 real estate projects, banking on unfinished properties generating cash to repay part of the funds in their $230 billion real estate support fund issued to investors. However, the expected rebound in the real estate market that the company bet on has yet to materialize. Given a series of disappointing economic data, fresh concerns about the real estate industry, and the spreading crisis in the shadow banking system, pressures on China's financial market are mounting. Despite the central bank's interest rate cut on August 15, investor confidence has not been boosted. Data provider Use Trust indicates that Zhongrong Trust is set to have 270 products mature this year, with a total value of 39.5 billion yuan, approximately 5.4 billion US dollars. Bloomberg Economics noted in a statement, the biggest danger is that a negative feedback loop is starting to kick in, where real estate pressures are causing financial system stress, impairing credit expansion, restraining economic growth, which in turn is exacerbating the slump in the property sector. Chinese property developers facing multiple defaults, raising a question, where did the proceeds from property sales go? Continuing with news related to China's real estate situation. The successive outbreaks of debt crises among Chinese real estate enterprises, from Evergrande to Country Garden, have stunned the nation. People across online communities are all asking, with such high property prices and buyers paying so much money, where did all the money go when these real estate companies are left with so much debt? In response to users' requests, the financial platform Initial Good Investment recently published an article that thoroughly analyzes the flow of funds in Chinese real estate companies. The article provides a clear explanation to the widely concerned question of where does the money from property sales go? This article has attracted a lot of attention and has become popular within online communities. This piece begins by straightforwardly explaining that to understand where the money from property sales goes, one must first comprehend how much money real estate companies make through property sales. This involves examining the cash received from selling goods and providing services, as seen in cash flow statements. The article then uses Vank, a large residential real estate developer in China, as an example to provide a detailed analysis of how the company's funds obtained through property sales are expended. Over the 12-year period from 2011 to 2022, Vank's total revenue from property sales amounted to 3.4791 trillion yuan, constituting its core business income. It mainly includes the following expenditures. Firstly, dividends. Vank, known as China's dividend giant, distributed a total of 90.6 billion yuan in dividends over the mentioned 12 years, accounting for only 2.6% of its cash revenue from property sales. In comparison, Evergrande and Country Garden had even lower dividend figures, at 80.8 billion yuan and 79.4 billion yuan respectively. Secondly, employee wages. Over the past 12 years, Vank paid a total of 119.7 billion yuan in wages to employees, with an average annual salary of 125,000 yuan, approximately 17,117 US dollars, per person, constituting only 3.44% of its cash revenue. Thirdly, interest payments to banks. Vank paid a total of 178 billion yuan to banks over the 12 years making up 5.12% of its revenue in cash. Fourthly, payments to upstream suppliers for materials. Over the past 12 years, Vank paid a total of 1.2248 trillion yuan to upstream enterprises, accounting for 35.2% of the cash received. This constitutes a significant portion of Vank's cash flow. Fifthly, land acquisition expenses. 
Over the 12-year period, Vank's total funding for land acquisition amounted to 1.2172 trillion yuan, constituting 34.99% of its cash revenue. This is another significant aspect of the cash flow. Lastly, various taxes and fees paid. Over the past 12 years, Vank paid a total of 464.7 billion yuan in various taxes and fees, making up 13.36% of its revenue in cash. This is higher than the combined total of payments to employees, dividends, and banks. Seventhly, it's the formation of fixed assets. Over the 12 years, Vank's cash used for constructing fixed assets amounted to 53 billion yuan, accounting for only 1.5%, which can be considered relatively low. When summing up the amounts spent in these seven major aspects, they collectively make up 96.2% of Vank's property purchasing income. To further clarify and summarize the above data, audiences can see clearly, the combined amount spent by Vank over the 12 years for land acquisition and tax payments constitutes 48.36% of its cash revenue, nearly half of the income. Following that is the amount taken by upstream enterprises, accounting for 35%. Finally, the funds used for banks, employees, and shareholders, dividends, collectively make up only 11.16% of the total. The article concludes by pointing out that Vank's financial situation is roughly as described, and it's estimated that Country Garden, Sunak, and Evergrande's cash flow directions are also not significantly different. After the article has gone viral on the internet, it has sparked heated discussions among Chinese internet users. One netizen commented, so, it means that half of the money is paid to the government through land acquisition and taxes. Another quickly added, this hasn't even taken into account the taxes paid by home buyers and the interest paid on their loans. Another netizen wrote, indeed, some real estate developers have said that the communities they developed haven't even covered their costs yet, as they spend a lot on land. The frightening part is the upstream portion, where a significant amount of money also flows to the state. CCP's National Security Department reveals inside system individuals forming daring squad, plotting armed coup. On August 15, the WeChat official account of the Chinese Ministry of State Security suddenly disclosed an old case, claiming that there was an attempt to subvert the state power in Yunnan, which supposedly reflects the situation of political security facing China. It is understood that the person involved in the case, a retired cadre from a school in Yunnan province, China, named Zisu, had been consistently expressing what is referred to as reactionary speech on the internet. Dissatisfied with the actions of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, in 2016, he planned to purchase weapons from abroad and recruit a suicide squad within China, aiming to overthrow the government. This operation was named the China Benghazi Project. However, during the planning phase, the CCP became aware of the situation, and the individuals involved were subsequently arrested. In 2019, they were sentenced to four years in prison by the authorities. Insiders revealed that Zisu was originally a member of the CCP system, but due to his involvement in dissent and resistance since the June 4 incident in 1989, he was arrested previously. In reality, the most recent arrest was mainly due to his opposition to Xi Jinping remaining in power. The re-emergence of this case has raised suspicions about the true purpose behind it. Recently, Xi Jinping has been reorganizing the entire national security system, demanding loyalty above all else. Now, with the release of this case, it's believed that the situation is extremely tense. Analysts suggest that under high pressure, it's possible that there are individuals within the system who are acting as both low-level reds and high-level blacks. It means that there might be individuals within the system who publicly show allegiance to the CCP but are involved in hidden or questionable activities that go against the party's principles. Commentator Wang Yi stated, in 2016, there were already people who wanted to overthrow Xi Jinping, so the situation now is much worse than in 2016, right? Regardless of the official explanation of this case, the actual release of this information brings about excitement and stimulation which might objectively encourage more people to oppose Xi Jinping. 
Xiu Fengzua, executive director of Chinese Human Rights, expressed to Radio Free Asia that China is reaching a point where authorities are pushing the people to rebel against them. He stated that the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, when cornered, employs the tactic of using cases like the one involving Zisu to divert attention from internal conflicts, which is an old strategy to create enemies and shift focus away from economic difficulties and youth unemployment rates. He mentioned that as a result, people in China are now living in a state of constant self-caution, leading to widespread reports and accusations. This situation could trigger unforeseen reactions that the CCP might not have anticipated, potentially causing the party to self-destruct. Flood disaster, Chinese government suspected to conceal death data. The capital city of Beijing, Tianjin City, in Hebei province have been severely affected by heavy rainfall, resulting in significant flooding, including both natural and artificially released floodwaters. From the footage and videos captured on-site by local residents, which we have continuously updated in our previous reports, it's evident that the extent of the casualties is substantial. However, as usual, the Chinese regime has reported a very low number of casualties, prompting criticism from numerous scholars and ordinary citizens for intentionally concealing the death toll. On August 12, China's Ministry of Water Resources sent a text message saying that, after a comprehensive analysis and judgment, the ministry announced that there was a major flood in the Zia River in the Haihe River Basin, and catastrophic floods in the Daqing River and Yongding River this year. The ministry called it the Haihe 23.7 catastrophic flood in the basin. Meanwhile, the death toll announced by the officials in various parts was extremely low, which is in contrast to what they called the catastrophic flood. On August 9, in a press conference on flood control and disaster relief, the Beijing administration announced that 33 people in the city had died due to the disaster as of August 8. In addition, five people had died during the emergency rescue, and 18 people were missing, including one rescue worker. On August 11, Hebei authorities held a press conference to announce that 29 people had died in the disaster in the province as of August 10, and 16 others had lost contact. Those regions have also not provided the number of livestock and property lost during the severe floods. Water preservation expert Wang Weiluo said that there is a great ability the communist regime is concealing the number of deaths as they often do any time disasters happen, so people will never know how many people died. By providing an extremely low number of deaths from the floods, the Chinese authorities want to maintain the stability of the society. In addition, local governments in many places are also violently suppressing the petitions of the flood victims. After the disaster-stricken victims held protests in Bazhou and Dingxing County in Baoding City of Hebei, the victims in Xinqing Town, Gao Bidian City, went to the city's administration office on August 8 to discuss their claims. The victims in Dongmeng Town also came out to protest. However, they all were suppressed by the police. According to Wang Weiluo, the CCP government believes that as long as there is no voice of protest, there will be no such disaster. He said, it doesn't matter how many people die, you will never know the exact number. Residents, countless deaths of flood discharge without warning. Ms. Zhang, a resident in Laishui County, Hebei province, said that because the county officials implemented flood discharge without warning, a large number of people and animals died both in the mountains and in the plains. Zhang said that she witnessed nine people swept away by the flood in Shitting Town alone. On the morning of August 1, Zhao Wenlian, a 60-year-old female villager, drove her car from Kujiamo Village, Shitting Town, intending to reach the town and take shelter from the heavy rain. However, the only road leading to the town was flooded, and her car was swept away. Her body has not been found yet. In response to these tragic deaths, Ms. Zhang expressed her anger, stating, the officials in Laishui County have lost their humanity by claiming that there were no casualties. I don't know how many innocent people have died like this under the CCP system. Such incidents would never occur in any other country. Laishui County is close to Beijing's Fangshan district. Some local people also confirmed that the villages and towns in the surrounding areas have suffered serious floods but there are few related reports from the authorities. Mr. Wang, a resident in Laishui County, said, 
Many villages were destroyed by floods and mudslides on July 31, and many villagers' houses were washed away. In Tangjiazwang village, Zayagezwang town, more than 2,000 people from 728 households lost contact with each other. The only road in the village was destroyed. Earlier, we also reported that a rescue worker had arrived at the scene in the Zhuozhou area of Hebei, an area heavily affected by the floods and serving as a sacrificial location to divert floodwaters from Beijing. Upon opening a house, he was shocked to find numerous floating corpses inside. The scene was so horrifying that even the journalist dared not film it on camera. It has been two weeks since the flood disaster, and a full accounting of the fatalities and economic damage in the Beijing Tianjin Hebei region remains unclear. Zhuizhou factory owner, we've been thrown back to the 70s and 80s after devastating flood. According to the Sound of Hope, a factory owner in Zhuizhou posted a message along with a reminder of overdue bills, saying that after the flood disaster, the company hasn't received any subsidies, yet the bill reminders have been prompt. The factory still lacks water and electricity, is filled with mud, and there are bodies outside the premises. However, the authorities have already started urging payment of electricity bills. The electricity meter is broken and unable to be read, so they are paying based on last month's electricity bill. The factory's accounting computer and tax control disk have been scrapped, but various taxes and fees must still be paid as usual before August 15th. This piece of news not only exposes the cruelty of the Chinese Communist Party's government but also unintentionally reveals the fact that there are bodies scattered all around the ground outside his factory, providing more insight into the overall situation in Zhuizhou. This owner sighs, this is what they call a man-made disaster. As seen in online videos, many areas of Zhuizhou are still submerged in water. In one video segment, someone complains that their house is now reeking due to the soaked water, and the foundation has started to sink. Another video shows an on-site visit, describing the scene as beyond description with devastation everywhere, muddy water and collapsed houses in the village, rooms filled with over 10 centimeters of mud, all furniture destroyed, and stored food gone moldy. Residents lament that they feel like they've been thrown back to the 70s and 80s. It would take three to five years to rebuild their homes. In just a few weeks, successive waves of disasters have struck China, and it's the common people who are suffering. What's even worse is that signs indicate both the economy and people's livelihoods are on the edge of a precipice, and the future might be even bleaker. Some individuals on social media summarized the most unfortunate group of people this year, those with money invested in Zhongji Enterprise Group, a leading Chinese asset management corporation on the brink of default, houses purchased from country garden holdings, wives working as pharmaceutical representatives, factories in Zhuizhou, and those who have entrusted an immigration agency to arrange immigration for their children. The root of suffering lies in the Chinese Communist Party. If you don't eliminate the party, there will always be a disaster waiting for you. The tsunami is approaching, be prepared. Flood control based on political needs makes China suffer huge economic loss in Zhuizhou. After the devastating flood disaster, apart from the significant human casualties, property, and livelihood, the diverted floods have also destroyed large-scale high-tech industrial parks in the area. According to a CCP's internal document, the estimated economic loss to the Chinese state-owned tech companies is astronomical. Particularly affected is the city of Zhuizhou, a provincial-level economic development zone, which includes the Jingnan Economic Development Zone, High-Tech Industrial Development Zone, and Songlindian Economic Development Zone. Many central governmental organizations and large state-owned enterprises have already set up their branches and sub-companies in Zhuizhou. According to local media reports, they have been hit hard by the floods. As per the CCP's internal document, which features an incomplete data form that estimates the economic losses of certain enterprises within the development zone, some projects are still submerged in floodwaters, some of which are as deep as 20 feet, and some aren't accessible because roads have been destroyed. The relevant losses are only estimates and the specific losses can't yet be verified. Among the recorded enterprises, China Shipbuilding Industry Corporation, CSIC, a military enterprise that manufactures aircraft carriers, suffered the biggest loss. 
six of its subcompanies and projects lost equipment and property worth hundreds of millions of yuan. According to preliminary estimates, the construction project of the China Power Research Center and the China Shipbuilding Industry Marine Equipment Science and Technology Industrial Park suffered a loss of 10 million yuan, approximately $1.38 million. The initial estimated loss for the Zhuizhou CSIC 612 project was 6.15 million yuan, approximately $850,000. In the construction project of the commercial complex of Zhuizhou Marine Equipment Science and Technology Industrial Park of CSIC, the preliminary estimated losses came to about 25.2 million yuan, approximately $3.48 million. The construction project of the residential area of Zhuizhou Marine Equipment Science and Technology Industrial Park of CSIC had a preliminary estimated loss of 205.5 million yuan, approximately $28.4 million. In the first section of the Photoelectric Technology Industrial Base Construction Project of Zhuizhou Marine Science and Technology Industrial Park of CSIC, the initial estimated loss was 60 million yuan, approximately $8.3 million. In the first phase construction project of Zhuizhou Industrial Base of CSIC Zhuizhou Great Wall Information Technology Company has a preliminary estimated loss of 50 million yuan, approximately $6.9 million. Other companies that suffered large losses include the Zhuizhou Base of China Iron and Steel Research Institute, with a preliminary estimate of 104.3 million yuan, approximately $14.4 million. Tianbao Smart Science and Technology Park, with a preliminary estimate of 40 million yuan, approximately $5.53 million, and Beijing Aerospace Sanfa High Tech Company, Limited Xinrui Electromechanical Zhuizhou Branch, with an estimated loss of 150 million yuan, approximately $20.7 million. The Inspur Group has lost an estimated 53.12 million yuan, approximately $7.34 million, due to the floods at its Big Data Service Center project in the Zhuizhou High-Tech Industrial Development Zone. According to mainland Chinese news portal Sohu.com, the project has a total investment of about 1.8 billion yuan, approximately $249 million, and a total construction area of 4.6 million square feet. Furthermore, PetroChina, a significant contributor to tax revenue in Zhuizhou, has an engineering facility in the development zone that incur a loss of 800 million yuan, $110.55 million. However, PetroChina's losses are not included in the CCP's economic loss data report. As previously reported, in order to safeguard Beijing and Xiongen, the new political center as per the CCP's plan, the Chinese government decided to divert floodwaters to Zhuizhou and nearby areas, effectively sacrificing them. This is the reason behind the severe flooding experienced by Zhuizhou. Wang Weiluo, a hydrology expert based in Germany, stated that the CCP's flood control strategy is driven by its political agenda. He remarked, the CCP's entire flood control strategy doesn't prioritize the safety of people's lives. The primary focus of its protection efforts lies on the main urban areas of Beijing and Tianjin, where the central government is situated, as well as the newly developed Xiongen New Area. Renowned businessman, hidden facts point to collapse of CCP. The current gloomy economic situation in China has attracted a lot of attention from the media, as well as analytical commentary from experts. The analysis below pertains to China's future from the perspective of Hong Kong entrepreneur Elmer Yuan, 74 years old, currently residing in the United States, and being wanted by the CCP for 1 million Hong Kong dollars, $127,600, in the city. According to Mr. Yuan, the main contributor to the CCP's fall is its financial debts. He said, we must look at China in this big picture. The big picture is the whole country is bankrupt. If China is one company, it's bankrupt. My definition of bankruptcy, for example, is you owe a lot of money to the bank, you cannot pay the interest, and you cannot pay the principal back, that's basically bankruptcy. This is the situation in China. According to CIC data, China's external debt was about $2.45 trillion in December 2022. Yuan doesn't buy that number. 
I would say they have roughly today about 6 trillion US dollars of debt, they only have 3 trillion of US dollars. Another concern is China's GDP. Yuan said, their GDP is a total lie. My estimate of their GDP is roughly maybe about 40% of what they claim. They claim their GDP is about 18 trillion US dollars. I think their GDP should be around 6 to 7 trillion yuan also argued that the lack of population is another factor contributing to the regime's collapse. They claim 1.4 billion people. My estimate is they have less than one inch. You need people to work to pay off the debt, right? According to Yuan, what makes things worse is unemployment. In contrast to China's National Bureau of Statistics figure of 21%, one Chinese scholar has published her youth unemployment finding of 46.5%, which has triggered strong public concern. But, Yuan gave a significant number, 500 million people unemployed, 300 million in the rural and 200 million in the urban area. So now with all these problems, not enough population, so much unemployment, higher debt, and lower GDP, all these things adding up, they'll be uncomfortable. The industrialist believes that by the winter of 2023, there will be people starving and freezing to death. That's why it, CCP, won't last for two to three years. However, Mr. Li Yuanhua, an associate professor in history education at Beijing's Capital Normal University, who now resides in Sydney, believes that it may not even take that long for the CCP to end. He said, it can collapse any time. It acts like a bully. Yuanhua referred to the massive flooding overflow in Beijing this month. The surge has been blamed for submerging Zhuizhou, a city bordering Beijing in the southwest, as local officials vowed to safeguard the capital and the new political hub of Xiongen from the floodwaters. Referring to the domestic news report in China, he said, it is nonsense to say that this rain is the worst in a hundred years. It's not that much rain at all. Other than the economic depression, low population, and high unemployment mentioned, Mr. Li Yuanhua also pointed to the real estate industry, which has seen Country Garden, one of China's largest property developers, in hot water. He said, same thing for Evergrande. In fact, these real estate have long been about to go bankrupt, but the authorities are afraid of too big a chain reaction, so they have been letting them hang on there. Regarding the military, Mr. Li said that nearly all officers in the CCP military have now bought their posts. They want to make money after buying the official positions. It's not like they want to defend the motherland. That's why Xi Jinping doesn't have anyone he can trust. If someone else gives him more money, he can betray you. It's all different interest groups. It's corrupted to the top. Mr. Li concluded that being unable to function correctly, the current Chinese society is living in a suspended state. He said, any incident, either wind or rain comes, and the country could be paralyzed. This year's flood in China has shocked the world. Thousands of homes were destroyed, and many people were swept away by the floodwaters. Now that the flood has receded, it has left behind a scene of devastated houses. The effort to rebuild will take a long time to complete. Moreover, after the floodwaters recede, they might bring along infectious diseases, environmental sanitation issues, problems with food supply, and clean drinking water. But a more important question is why almost every year in China, under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party CCP, there are such severe floods? According to CCP's media, the blame is placed on excessive rainfall, they label it as a natural disaster. While the disaster certainly results from heavy rainfall, it's also because the CCP's government has been damaging nature over the years, building hydroelectric dams recklessly to make money. Many Chinese citizens claim that this disaster occurred because the CCP released water from dams and diverted floodwaters without warning. Facing the callousness of Beijing officials who, while releasing floodwaters, caused the deaths of thousands and left millions homeless, the national CCTV television station shirked responsibility and even broadcasted false news to deceive the people. Officials relaxed while vacationing in Beidei, preparing for internal power struggles. Thousands of people in Hebei province had to struggle to survive after the flood. They had to take to the streets in protest, which led to violent clashes with the police. Will the people of China awaken before it's too late? In today's program, let's explore the cruelty of the CCP in its response to this flood disaster.
letting out floodwaters without warning ahead of time turns natural disasters into huge catastrophes. In this current flood disaster, the sudden rise in water levels that caught Chinese citizens off guard has led to a grave catastrophe. The cause is the emergency release of floodwaters from reservoirs, but the CCP failed to provide advance warnings for downstream residents to evacuate, resulting in severe casualties. Particularly alarming are instances when reservoirs secretly release floodwaters in the middle of the night, and people wake up at dawn to find their surroundings submerged in water. Surviving such situations is a stroke of luck. Why are flood releases not preceded by warnings? There are various opinions on this matter. Some believe that authorities fear taking responsibility, so they secretly release floodwaters at night without informing the public. Others argue that the government doesn't want to compensate citizens for damages, so they avoid flood warnings. They wait until floodwaters submerge everything, then attribute it to heavy rainfall. For example, during the recent flooding in Basho District, while CCTV blamed the flooding on heavy rain, the reality was that the flooding resulted from reservoir releases. This caused anger among the people of Basho, who protested in front of the local government building. As a result, they were met with violent police action. Offering up citizens as sacrifices to safeguard the capital and CCP officials. The Chinese Communist Party CCP, system is not a conventional government, rather, it's a system that views serving in an official capacity as the objective and value to strive for, or an ideology centered around power. As a result, when officials contemplate any decision, their primary concern often isn't the citizens, but rather the central party and their own official standings. At the onset of the flood, NIFeng, the party secretary of Hebei province, publicly stated the need to reduce the pressure of flood prevention and control in Beijing, and resolutely fulfill the role of the city to protect the capital. As a result, floodwaters were diverted and released into areas like Shuizhou and Hebei province. While Beijing and the new Xiong'an district remained safe, Shuizhou and Hebei became the hardest-hit areas with heavy casualties. As is known, in the past, local leaders in China were referred to as local parent officials, meaning that they would care for the people as their own children, and people could trust the officials. However, under the CCP system, the top priority of local leaders is to support the central party and to seize opportunities for personal advancement during chaotic times, which elevates the central party's influence. The number of people who may sacrifice their lives is essentially of little concern to these officials. This mentality of protecting the capital is protecting the officials has been prevalent in the history of the CCP. For instance, during the three years of famine in China in 1960, Li Jingquan, the party secretary of Sichuan province at that time, insisted on diverting Sichuan's grain to Beijing. He chose to let the people of Sichuan starve rather than the people of Beijing. The result led to millions of people in Sichuan dying of hunger. Armed police take over the flood-affected area, clean up the scene, prevent information leaks, and conceal the disaster. On August 5, Mr. Chen, a local resident, told the Epoch Times that 500 personnel from the Hebei Armed Police Force arrived in Zhuzhou that day to take over rescue operations, and all civilian rescue forces were instructed to evacuate. After the Hebei Armed Police Force took over local rescue operations, the civilian rescue teams were asked to leave the scene. Local residents mentioned that dead bodies were scattered throughout the village alone, and these officials demanded that the civilian rescue teams leave the scene mainly out of concern that the truth of the disaster would be exposed. A report from the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda team has been leaked online, revealing that the party is extremely worried about the real situation becoming public. The report says, we found that some rescue teams unlawfully used mobile networks during the rescue process, spreading negative information and images about the rescue to the outside world with bad intentions. This seriously damaged our district's image. Rescue forces unable to access disaster area On August 1, Southern Weekend newspaper revealed that many private rescue teams had arrived in Zhuizhou but were blocked. According to regulations, Non-local civilian rescue teams need an invitation from the Emergency Management Authority where the incident occurred before being allowed to conduct cross-provincial rescues. 
Afterward, they must report to the local emergency management authority, and only after approval can the rescue teams start their operations. Online videos show that many rescue vehicles were stopped on the highway, preventing them from entering the disaster area. Since they didn't have invitations and Zhuizhou authorities had no one to receive these teams, they couldn't proceed with their rescue efforts. After the news was disclosed, it sparked outrage on social media, accusing the government of having too many complicated procedures and disregarding the lives of victims. Under public pressure, Zhuizhou officials announced on August 2 that private rescue teams no longer needed invitations to enter Zhuizhou as long as they registered their information. However, just as the rescue operations were commencing, on August 3, there were reports that Zhuizhou authorities did not act on this announcement. More than 70 out of over 100 local civilian rescue teams were forced to evacuate. Not only were the rescue teams evacuated, but the accounts of many rescuers were also blocked. Commentator Tang Jingyuan on current affairs issues mentioned that according to the consistent practice of the CCP, this was to strictly seal off news and prevent the spread of the grim truth of the disaster-stricken area as much as possible. An online chat message from Beijing's rescue forces revealed that Mentugu District in Beijing had been hit by the flood on July 31, and over 200 victims' bodies were found at the disaster site. However, officials reported only over 20 deaths. Wang Weiluo, an expert living in Germany, pointed out that there are still many issues regarding this flood that the outside world cannot see, mainly due to undisclosed information. He speculated that other areas in Hebei might be more severely affected than Zhuizhou. Trying to prevent disasters is just empty talk. A few days before the flood disaster struck, the media, under the control of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, extensively promoted Xi Jinping's new book on flood control, titled Delve Deep into Studying and Implementing Xi Jinping's Important Expositions on Flood Control. They praised Xi as pointing out the forward direction of flood control in the new era and claimed that his flood control ideology is summarized in a 16-character motto, prioritize water conservation, balance spatial distribution, manage systems, and make dual efforts. This 16-character motto might sound lofty, but in reality, they are just empty words. The truth also reveals a stark difference between Xi Jinping's flood control approach and the disaster preparedness methods employed by the rest of the world. People around the world know that whenever a major storm or heavy rainfall is imminent, not only do the standard armed forces prepare in advance for disaster response, ready to deploy for rescue operations at any moment, but national leaders also typically visit disaster response command centers to monitor and gather the latest information. They also remind citizens about the latest disaster preparedness information. For example, whenever a typhoon approaches Taiwan, the president monitors the Central Emergency Operations Center and calls on the public to prepare and know where to evacuate. In the United States, before a storm hits, the president often holds press conferences to encourage citizens to prepare for the impending disaster. However, Xi Jinping, who supposedly outlined the new era's flood control direction, has not shown any concrete deployment or specific command before heavy rainfall occurs. This lack of preparation led to the sudden onslaught of a massive flood that caught both the government and citizens off guard, ultimately resulting in the largest flood disaster in half a century. Therefore, the flood control motto, presentation, and analysis that the CCP claims are all empty words, devoid of substance. High officials avoid responsibility, don't know anything. In normal countries around the world, when a major disaster strikes the public, it's essential for national leaders to be on the front line to express condolences, inquire about the disaster, and assess the situation. This is a common practice. For example, in 2018, when a major flood occurred in Chiayi City, Taiwan, President Tsai Ing-wen drove in an armored vehicle to the disaster site to assess the situation. However, the people shouted at her, demanding that she get out of the vehicle and experience the suffering of those affected by the disaster firsthand. Tsai Ing-wen did indeed step out of the vehicle and walked, accepting the grievances and complaints of the affected citizens. 
this on-site assessment not only conveys empathy to the victims and addresses the public's concerns, but also focuses more resources on disaster relief efforts and quicker restoration of order in the affected area. However, in this Hebei flood disaster, which clearly occurred near the capital city of Beijing, not a single member of the seven-member standing committee of the Political Bureau of the Chinese Communist Party's Central Committee was seen to assess the disaster situation. Even Xi Jinping himself was nowhere to be found. Even in Zhuizhou, the city hit hardest by the disaster, the mayor and the city's party secretary were absent. What's more ironic is that the Chinese Communist Party's media channels claimed that Xi Jinping personally commanded and arranged flood control efforts, comparing it to his directives during the pandemic. But whether in Hebei or Heilongjiang, he has never appeared at the disaster sites. So, how can he personally command and arrange? Hence, while the Chinese Communist Party constantly proclaims to serve the people, when the people are in dire straits, party officials scramble to avoid responsibility and disappear. Why is that? Firstly, it's due to fear of facing criticism from disaster-affected citizens and the international community. Secondly, there's concern that their personal safety might be compromised. Thirdly, to shift responsibility, especially for high-ranking officials of the party's central committee, all they need to do is stay out of the picture, and they can easily shift blame onto local officials, while still maintaining their own image of being great, glorious, and correct. This is the genuine thought process of high-ranking Chinese Communist Party officials. Fabricating fake videos and images, exploiting disasters for CCP propaganda. Whenever a major disaster occurs, it's the most exciting time for the Chinese Communist Party's media outlets because it provides them with an opportunity to grandiosely stage and fabricate content for their propaganda purposes. For instance, the most infamous distortion in the media coverage of the floods in Hebei is the dramatic rescue helicopter scene by CCTV. The government deployed helicopters and photographers to rooftops to rescue affected people, creating a sense of extreme danger. However, the camera unintentionally captured the water level at the scene, showing that the water only reached up to the car's wheel. The shallow flooding was turned into a Hollywood-style rescue mission, effectively illustrating the party's concern and protection for people's lives. Some managed to capture local authorities pretending to carry sandbags to build flood barriers. In reality, this was just a deception aimed at impressing superiors while misleading the public. There's even a photo from Xinhua News Agency where soldiers seem to be stacking sandbags. However, did you notice the prominently displayed party flag and the troop numbers in the foreground? Frankly speaking, this is a textbook staged composition meant to highlight the CCP and the military's insignia to gain recognition from the leadership. Looking at another picture, soldiers are evidently depicted combating the disaster in the darkness, with a pitch-black backdrop, yet the party flag in the distance is deliberately illuminated to stand out. This is not just a clearly fake photo but a deliberate exploitation of people suffering to glorify the CCP. Therefore, the CCP's organized mourning ceremonies and support for the disabled are another artificial disaster created by the CCP. Hence, when CCP media outlets don't report the truth of the disaster and casualties, it's not surprising. But what they consistently do is release a large number of fake photos and videos, meticulously staged to deceive the people and seek personal gain. This is utterly deceptive and detrimental behavior by CCP media outlets. The Communist Party is a bad force against the universe. The CCP must be destroyed. The Nine Commentaries on the Communist Party points out that the Communist Party is a bad force against the universe. The CCP has nine major bad genes, evil, deception, manipulation, conflict, seizing, thuggery, division, annihilation, control. Its badness can prevail because of the belief that humans can overcome nature. Nowadays, more and more people no longer believe in the deceptive words of communism. However, the CCP's evil system still controls people, and its culture erodes people's souls. The Communist Party promotes the idea that humans can overcome nature, disregarding the natural order. The Communist Party might find true joy in this, but the people suffer greatly because of it. There was a time when the CCP implemented an agriculture policy focused on grain production. 
They extensively cultivated unsuitable mountainous and grassland areas, and filled in China's rivers and lakes. The result was massive destruction of China's natural ecology. Today, China's environment is on the verge of collapse, with rivers like the Hai and Yellow River drying up, and pollution in the Huai and Yangtze River cutting off the lifeblood of the Chinese nation. Grasslands in Gansu, Qinghai, Inner Mongolia, and Xinjiang have disappeared, and rolling sandstorms hit the central plains. This year, the CCP has again implemented policies like returning farmland to forest, destroying once recovered forest areas in many places. The CCP, with an aggressive stance, plundered the land, oppressed and exploited its people, going against nature and defying natural laws. In the end, it will surely face punishment from the heavens, earth, and natural order. Recently, a Chinese citizen named Dong Hui expressed on a website for quitting the CCP, the evil party, in order to protect Beijing and Xi Jinping's so-called millennial plan for the Xiongen New Area, is willing to unleash floods to inundate Hebei. The party's officials are useless, only singing praises and letting Hebei act as a moat for the capital. They don't care about people's lives. Various natural disasters and human calamities show that the CCP is about to be destroyed, and it must be. Zhang Tiani from Hebei stated, in June 2019, various domestic platforms were uniformly claiming that the Hong Kong protests were incited by the US and UK. But I felt something was off. Even a county magistrate listens to both sides before making a decision, but in China, under the CCP's rule, there's simply no other voice. So, in June 2020, I successfully bypassed the Great Firewall using technical means. Over the past three years, I've witnessed the darkness under the CCP system, the secondary disasters during the pandemic, and the sins of history. What is hell? I think China under CCP rule is a vivid example. I'm fortunate that I was able to free myself from the brainwashing. But I'm also unfortunate because of my morals and conscience. They prevent me from doing harmful things and harming others for money, which also means I can't earn enough to escape this hell. Perhaps the most tragic are not those brainwashed, but people like me who recognize the CCP's evil but are powerless. Finally, I willingly quit the Young Pioneers and Communist Youth League. Mai Yuyuan stated, Under the rule of the communist bandits, most people don't live like human beings, yet they don't realize it. From birth, education requires money and as you grow up, buying a house comes with a mortgage, which makes people's minds focused only on earning money. They can't afford to get sick, and the money they earn isn't enough to pay the hospital. What's most infuriating is that the thoughts of everyone have been numbed. People living in the country are worse off than leaks, they are like miners under the communist bandits. The party and the nation are two different things. Not loving the party doesn't mean not loving the country. I hope Chinese people with thoughts will work together to overthrow it and give our country a better future. I declare quitting the Communist Youth League and Young Pioneers. The Tuadang Movement, also known as the Quitting the Chinese Communist Party Movement, is a non-violent movement in China that urges citizens to sever their connections with the CCP and its affiliated organizations. This is achieved through a public declaration renouncing any previous ties with the party, including its affiliated groups like the Communist Youth League and Young Pioneers. These disavowals are collectively known as the Three Withdrawals. The Tuadang movement was triggered by the editorial series Nine Commentaries on the Communist Party, first published in the Chinese language edition of the Epoch Times on November 19, 2004. The series comprehensively exposes the bloody history of the CCP and gives an in-depth analysis of the deceptive, violent, cultish, and rogue nature of the party in different areas of history, politics, economy, culture, and faith. Tuadang is facilitated in China by an estimated 20 million volunteers, many of them practitioners of Falun Gong, a traditional spiritual practice targeted for eradication by the CCP since 1999. According to GlobalToADang.org, at the time this video was published, more than 417 million Chinese individuals have decided to quit the CCP and its affiliated organizations. This is a nightmare for the Chinese Communist Party, as the collapse is coming from within. The doomsday of the Chinese Communist Party is getting closer and closer. 
if you are a Chinese person who was once a member of the CCP and its associated organizations, we strongly encourage you to declare your withdrawal from these groups for the sake of a brighter future. Simply click on the link to adang.org, choose I want to withdraw from the CCP, and follow the provided instructions to submit your information. The link will be provided in the video's description below. We value your thoughts and opinions on today's topic, so don't forget to leave a comment in the section below. Share your insights and join the discussion. If you want to stay updated with more captivating topics from China Truths, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Stay tuned for more intriguing content.